Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, attending uh, today's webinar. Um, I'm going to talk today about heat treating, metals heat treating, and the various processes that are involved in heat treating that are ideally suited to non-contact temperature measurement. These are measurements that cannot be made by thermocouples or RTDs. And so this is our applications. These are specifically our applications. And, and there's lots of people doing this. So let's get into the presentation. So first of all, heat treating is not just one thing. There's, there's many, many different processes that can be classified as heat treating. But basically, people will use heat and maybe one other thing to change the structure of a metal uh, and improve its structure or its surface condition so that it can be used in a, a, a more demanding application. Um, so as I say down here, things like the structural density, the strength, the flexibility, sometimes corrosion resistance, surface hardness, grain size, so all of those things can be affected within the metal through one or more different heat treating processes. And all heat treaters need heat, because that's why they're called heat treaters. They need to measure temperature. And many of the processes that they use cannot be measured using contact forms of temperature measurement. So many of them cannot use a thermocouple. Many of them cannot use an RTD uh, because of the conditions involved in that particular process. So there's many, many hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of heat treaters and metal forgers around the world. And all of them are competing to get business from customers like automotive customers or aerospace customers, people who demand the highest quality in components and making sure that these components do not fail. Um, as I say here, heat treaters are obsessed with quality. Okay, so, and they cannot make things that have problems because this is a, um, this is a spool from inside a turbine engine in an aircraft. Uh, the blades are slotted into these slots around the edges, and you can see in this particular one, it's fractured in a couple of places. And really, the last thing you want to do is you know, be on a, an aircraft, and you have to come back to the airport because something like this has happened. Okay, so, so heat treating is a very, very quality-based set of applications and people are really, again as I say, obsessed with this quality. So let's start by going into the individual applications that can only be done by non-contact methods. So the first one here is induction hardening. And here you would use an induction coil. Uh, it would track a surface, heating that surface bit by bit to give you a very hard finish on the surface of the material and yet still a durable, durable nature underneath. And in this particular case, uh, we can see a very large ring gear and this induction hardening uh, head is going down each one of those in turn and then it will index to the next one and go down this one. And you cannot measure the temperature of that gear tooth using a thermocouple or an RTD because it's an RF induction field. And if you put a thermocouple or an R RTD into that induction field, if you get close to it, it will excite and give you spurious temperatures. And if you get even closer, it will melt. So you cannot get a thermocouple anywhere close to one of these. And yet a non-contact radiation thermometer just looks at that surface, 
measures the temperature, gives you an accurate measurement, and it's the only way to do it. Okay. Here's an induction hardening uh, one on saw blades. So again, um, for the same reasons with this induction coil, you cannot use a contact device because uh, it would be affected by that induction field. And so on saw blades, when you go into a, into a hardware store and you see a saw blade that is blued along the edges, what that means is that it's been induction heated to give very, very hard teeth but still retain the very malleable and durable and flexible saw blade so that the rest of the blade doesn't crack. It's able to support those very tight teeth. Here's another process which is induction, and this is now not induction hardening, but induction heating. And again, in this case, a rod is, is being passed through an induction coil coming up to temperature, and then could be pressed into something. But this, this method of heating is very efficient on ferrous materials. So it's widely used induction heating on ferrous materials. Again, you cannot get anywhere close to this with a thermocouple or an RTD, because it would be excited by the RF field, and it would be unable to make a measurement. And so in these particular cases, we typically use a, a, a ratio thermometer would be very good because it doesn't need to see the full spot size fully filled. We can look at a partially filled target with a ratio thermometer and get a very accurate reading. So for instance, the Spot R100 or the R100 fiber optic. And then if you're looking with a portable, the Cyclops 100L would be very good to see through the gaps. Okay, here's another induction heating application. Again, ideally suited uh, to non-contact temperature measurement. You, you can't put a thermocouple anywhere close to this. The second thing is if you look carefully at this, you'll see in this particular case, this is in a vacuum. And so there is a quartz chamber around this with a vacuum atmosphere. And then there's the induction heating coil inside that. And so again, a, a ratio thermometer is ideal for this because the ratio thermometer can see through the quartz without any interference at all. And then it can see a partially filled target and give an accurate temperature measurement. So again, things like the Spot R100 or the L100 fiber optic, or again, with a Cyclops of 100L, focused very short between the gaps in the coil. So here's one of the things that induction heating is used for. Um, if, if you're making high quality fasteners, and uh, let me explain fasteners. Fasteners is what most people would call a bolt or a screw. But usually when somebody is calling it a faster, fastener, it is something that is very high quality and may be used on an aircraft or may be used on a piece of very high performance equipment or machinery and something that is made to standards which are much stronger and better than a standard bolt. And in these cases, the, the blank, which is this piece here, is heated in an induction field. And then once it comes to temperature, and it has to be the exact temperature, which is why they're measuring temperature, then the thread is rolled into the surface. It's not cut. It's, so it's not cut with a die. It's, it's actually rolled into the surface, and so there are no imperfections or cracks on the surface that may cause the fastener to fail. And so this is why when Boeing buys a fastener, it pays $15 and not 15 cents. So here's a, another application. This one is flame hardening, and in this particular case, we've got two photographs here of a, a wheel that's going to be used on an overhead crane 
and the surface of the wheel is being hardened to give it durability for a long life, but they don't want the, the inner part of this wheel to be hardened. It has to be durable and slightly flexible, and so they are using a flame hardening technique. Now, it, it might seem obvious, but if you want to measure the surface of that material when it's being flame hardened, you can't use a thermocouple or any other contact device because that thermocouple is sitting in the flame and getting heated by the flame and, and it's not measuring the temperature of the surface of the material. Now in this particular case, if we use a, a 3.9 micrometer wave band non-contact thermometer like an FTS or a Cyclops 390L, then we see through that flame, that flame is not seen at all, not measured at all, and we see directly the surface that is being heated. And so this is the only way to accurately measure that temperature. Again, they will not be trying to use thermocouples because they cannot work in this application. Here's a very similar situation. Um, a lot of people now when they are hardening metal surfaces, use laser hardening. And, and laser hardening has a number of advantages. Um, it, it's very rapid, so that the heat is applied very rapidly to the surface of the material. And it, the heat penetrates a very short distance into the metal, and the metal is rotated, and so this laser is passing that area and going on to the next bit of area and the next, and heating, and then the substance of the product, the substrate itself, does the quenching to the surface. So the, the substrate of the metal actually becomes the heat sink that does the quenching. This process is becoming increasingly, uh, increasingly used because not only is it accurate and fast, but it's much lower cost than other methods of heat treating and hardening surfaces. Now, the lasers that are used for these kind of processes are YAG lasers. And YAG lasers typically work below 1.1 micrometers, so shorter wavelengths than 1.1 down, there are, there are maybe four major wavelengths that YAG lasers use. And they come down to the close to the visible and then up to about 1.1 micrometers. And so if you use a thermometer with a 1.6 or a 2.4 micrometer response, it does not see the laser reflections at all. It only measures the surface of the part. Okay, so, so by using something like um, a spot R160 or a spot R210 or a Cyclops 160, you're working at a wavelength that does not see that YAG laser and is not affected by that YAG laser. And so this is a perfect uh, application for using one of our spot ratio devices or a Cyclops 160. Again, you can't use thermocouples or RTDs because the laser would heat up that sensor and it would give a wrong reading. So you have to do it by non-contact methods. Here's another one, uh, plasma, plasma nitriding. And so you'll see a number of components that are plasma nitrided. Um, Plasma nitriding is another one of these treatments that gives the surface of a material an enhanced durability. You'll see it very often used in ring and pinion gears. So if you can imagine on a car axle, then those, these ring gears are plasma nitrided. And the plasma nitriding gives a very durable surface finish but the rest of the gear is unaffected by that hard finish. And so it can, it can be used for years and years and years and not crack because it is slightly flexible. 
and only the areas which contact in the gears have this hard surface. Now, if you put a contact device into one of these plasma nitriding areas, the contact device will be contaminated by the, the plasma coating process. And so again, the advantage here is to use a non-contact device. And in this particular case, 1.6 micrometers sees through the plasma, does not see the plasma at all. And so in this case, a spot M160 or a Cyclops 160L would be used. Here's another one. In this case, what we see here is we see a turbine blade, which is used in a jet engine. And these turbine blades are coated with a ceramic material. And that ceramic material gives them durability to withstand many, many hours at very high temperatures uh, without affecting the metal beneath. And so these coatings are applied using a high temperature plasma spray and in this particular case 3.9 micrometers is used the FTS or the Cyclops 390 or the FTIE 390 imager can all be used on this application they will not see the plasma they will only see the surface temperature of the blade that's actually being coated so if you have anybody in your area who is doing repair work on turbine engines, so I know, for instance, there's a lot of repair work on turbine engine goes up, engines go on in Turkey. Um, the people who do this kind of work are doing a very high-quality process, and it's not possible to measure the temperature accurately and yes, you, unless you're using a non-contact thermometer. Okay, the next one, um, stress relieving and annealing. So here we can see a, um, uh, a construction vehicle, and you see these large sprockets on these things. And again, these things have very hard finishes to the sprocket teeth themselves, but the rest of that wheel has to be very flexible and durable. Okay, and in this particular case, an arc thermal imager is ideal to see the total circumference of that wheel and the measurement within that circumferential area. You can put a, a polygonal shaped, um, a donut shaped sampling area on the outside of that ring gear and, and sample just the teeth temperatures rather than all of it. And this prevents cracking once the part is quenched. It gives a very durable part for use within the vehicle. Okay, the next one, um, rotary forging. Many people have forging processes, and, and this is where you are condensing the metal, you are making a very, very high density structure, changing the grain structure within the metal uh, by hammering at high temperatures. And it's very important to monitor the temperature of the material as it's being forged and hammered, because at some point it will become too cool to be forged anymore and it has to go back into a reheat furnace and be reheated again before they can continue. And you can't touch the surface of this because it's being hammered and so non-contact is the only way. And a lot of people will use fiber optic devices because they can mount the electronics away from the big forging press and away from the vibrations and make the measurement here and make a very accurate measurement. Rotary forging, very similar to the last one. This is a, uh, you probably don't get a sense of scale with this one, but this, this product is about two meters long and um, almost a meter in diameter. And these gigantic forge hammers are coming down on this thing, pressing it uh, into a tighter and more durable material. 
So again, they can only forge down to certain temperatures once they get down to that bottom limit. It's very important that they don't try hammering it anymore. It has to go back and be reheated in a furnace and then it comes back again for more hammering. Here's another one and you see this very large part here. Here's this forge press. There's the anvil beneath it and there's this with hundreds of tons of pressure hammer that keeps coming down on the product. And in this particular case, it's being held in a rotary chuck, which is rotating it step by step as it's being hammered. And then this thing is on this gigantic vehicle here. I don't know if you can see these tires. Okay, so this is a, also an extremely large uh, casting that is being forged. And again, a spot R100 fiber optic would be perfect for this, or, or a portable, the Cyclops 100L. Roll forging, very, very, um, very, very important, very, very widespread. Lots of large gear mechanisms, lots of large bearing races are made by roll forging, a ring gear. Okay, and again, the temperature is very important to measure. And as it's being rolled through here, you can't measure it with a contact device because it's, it's in contact with these rolls. But a, a, a non-contact radiation thermometer is absolutely perfect for doing this. So I've mentioned rotary forging and also drop forging, which is a, a similar process of hammering materials together. And if we look at things that are made by drop forging, here's a drop for, forge press. A part goes into it, um, a, a, a hydraulic uh, press comes down on it with hundreds of tons of pressure to form it into a very high quality, uh, durable material. These are some of the things that get drop forged. So many, many components that are used in automobile and vehicle uh, transmissions and powertrains. You'll get things like this where these are, if you're familiar, these are connecting rods in an engine. It used to be some years ago that connecting rods were all cast. Uh, now with the much higher horsepower figures coming out of engines, they need to have stronger connecting rods otherwise they would fail. And so these are forged connecting rods which are pressed under immense pressure to get a more durable and, and higher density material. This is actually a photograph off a heat treaters uh, website and you'll see they're measuring things. Oh look, they're using a cyclops to measure the temperature of an item that they are working on. Okay, so um, again, all of these people, heat treaters and forgers, what they do is temperature, what they do is quality. What they absolutely need is proven high accuracy temperature measurement. And in most of these cases, they cannot use contact measurement devices. They need to use non-contact, and that's what land is about. Now, let's show you how important it is to these people quality. If you go to one of these companies' websites, uh, usually, you'll see um, on the second or third page of the website a thing that is all about quality. So this is an example from a company called Bodycoat. This is their UK site. Bodycoat is a global heat treater. And in this particular case, you can see they're showing all their ISO certifications, all of these other NADCAP, which is for uh, aerospace use. And so it is so important for these people, the way they win business from their competitors is showing their quality, their certifications, and, and everything to do with this. So these people are not shy about spending money for quality because it is their business. So again, uh, we, we look at from the other end and we look here. Here's um, a Boeing. There's a uh, Boeing processor, process specification qualified processors list. 
steal, seek treatment of, okay? And then they have a list of the people, the companies who are qualified to heat treat for them. So, you know, somebody like Boeing will not buy from somebody who is not qualified first to do these measurements. So after I found this information, I thought, well, Airbus has to have the same thing. Yes, they do. And so Airbus have the same listings of, you know, of mad cap processes that need these very high quality uh, measurements. And you'll see heat treaters all over the world who are getting these approvals because the, the world is a very small place. People like Boeing and Airbus buy their components from everywhere. They, they buy them from India, they buy them from you know, Singapore, they buy them from China, okay? And so all of these people have to have these certifications and they have to have high quality certified temperature measuring equipment to get those. So the, the end user, the end user uh, heat treaters, the people who will do work for other companies, they will take components from other companies and they will heat treat them and then send them back. These are companies like Firth, Rickson and Bodycoat, um, Aerotech, Acres, SMV, ATI, just, just a sample of the, the companies that are doing this work. And again, their customers are people who need the highest accuracy temperature measurements. They require this ISO documentation on everything that they get worked on. Um, again, end user companies, a lot of these end user companies who are using heat treated products also have internal heat treating facilities. A lot of the products that are made for Boeing or Sukhoi or Tupolev are processes which are secret. And so the components which are not secret can be heat treated by people who are outside. But components that are sensitive are heat treated in their own in-house heat treating facilities. And again, these same people have the same requirements for quality temperature measurement and, and the ultimate in, in measurement accuracy. So as I say, these companies are selling their products for hundreds of thousands of dollars per pound of weight. So for each kilo, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, that's the, the added cost, the added benefit that they're putting into the product by heat treating it. They can receive something which is a base metal, and the thing they ship out after heat treating has many, many, many times more value. So how do you find heat treaters in your areas? Well, the, the short answer is, is contact your local Amatec land area manager. Okay, the area managers have got listings of heat treaters in each territory. Okay, so in this particular example, I've got, uh, I've got one here, which is a list of heat treaters in Germany. On this side, I've got a, uh, a list of heat treaters here in Japan. Um, I, I don't understand Japanese, so, um, but I'm sure my Japanese colleagues do. Um, again, we've got listings of these heat treaters wherever they are, in whatever country, in whatever region they are around the world. So this is an absolutely ideal, perfect application for non-contact temperature measurement. These applications I've shown you today cannot be measured by other devices. It has to be a non-contact measurement device. Okay. And so it's just a matter of defining the heat treater, what the processes are they have within their facility, and then going there. And again, as you can see from this heat treater's webpage, you know, even on their webpage, they've got things like a cyclops on there as this is how we do our quality work. So, all right, uh, I'm coming to the question and answer session now. So. 
again, thank you, everyone. Uh, before I open up the phones, um, I'm going to remind you that, as usual, uh, I do a recording of these sessions, and that recording uh, will be sent to all of you afterwards. Um, the other thing is if, if I don't answer any question or you don't get to asking a question at the end here, if you just send me an email afterwards, I'll get to you and I'll uh, give you uh, an answer uh, as soon as I can. So right now I am going to open up the telephone lines.